going on to another part of the cycle here about bioinnovation, I think it's just been that, for me, that recurring theme of how the cross-cutting themes of people have to talk to each other from different sectors, different technology areas, and, and so forth, and bringing in the, the animal husbandry, which hadn't come up before, I think is another angle that we often don't consider. But then we move on to the next one, which is accepting we can't prevent everything, and then we can diagnose it, and we want to make treatments, how are we going to make them? Um, so I'm very pleased to hand over to Adrian Tutingi from um, oh, mine's gone blank. Taylor Wessing, sorry, um, who's going to run us through the panel. Adrian. Thanks, Tony. Hi, everyone. Um, as Tony says, I'm Adrian Tutingi from Taylor Wessing. I think the reason I've been asked to chair this panel is a few years ago, I spent some time as the general counsel at the Sun and Gene Therapy Catapult. I've remained involved in Sun and Gene Therapy space, helping companies spin out both cell therapy companies, gene therapy companies. Um, helping them with strategic collaborations and also I'm involved in the gene therapy innovation hubs which LifeArc and BBSRC are funding around the UK. Um, so this session is to focus on the importance of planning manufacturing um, for early stage companies in the sun and gene therapy space. Um, we've got a stellar panel and I'm going to ask them to spend 30 seconds introducing themselves. So Steve, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, my name is Steve Howell. Uh, I work at Lexus SmithKline. Uh, but I have a, a long history in cell and gene therapy. Um, while these therapies can be used to, to treat a number of disorders, in fact, a very wide range of disorders at the flex, so we're concentrating on uh, oncology applications. My team is the product development team, so we're responsible for um, in, uh, innovating and producing manufacturing <coughs> platforms um, and applying those platforms to our portfolio for a, a number of different applications. Thanks, Laura. Hi there, uh, my name is Laura Jespers. I'm the CSO at Sac Therapeutics. Uh, it's a company based here at the Vibraham uh, Research Campus. Uh, we came here about a, a year ago, uh, so it's nice to be part of, of this community. Uh, we are developing a, a cell platform based on iPSC, so it's an allergenic cell platform for therapies in a wide range of, of disease areas. Um, before that, I was at GSK. I was actually a colleague of Steve. Uh, so I decided to make the move from away from uh, a big pharma to a small biotech and then encounter all the fun challenges with CMC manufacturers <laughs> for cell and gene therapy. Cool. Hi, I'm Angela Osborne. I'm the CEO at Exmoor Pharma. Uh, we are a, a manufacturing partner in cell and gene therapies, helping you get your products as quickly as possible to patients. And uh, we work in kind of four main areas, CMC consulting and, and I think not everybody here is a manufacturing person, so CMC is anything to do with manufacturing and quality of the product, uh, process development and scale up in our labs, um, and from next year, clinical manufacturing in our own facility. Uh, and then finally, um, when our clients are ready to move on and have their own facilities, we, we design manufacturing facilities. Um, personally, I'm a biochemical engineer by background, a, a PhD from UCL. Um, started my life in a startup biotech company, uh, moved into uh, an engineering services company designing large manufacturing facilities for the GSKs and, and similars. Um, I started Exmoor in 2004 actually when we bought a, a farm on Exmoor. Um, to follow on from the previous conversation, we used very few antibiotics on our farm. Um, but, but the only kind of farmer in, uh, in Exmoor was spelt with an F. So. Um, it was, it was necessary then to, uh, to do something different, so we started Exmoor Pharma. And that's moved really from being a biopharma consultancy through to process development laboratories, through to the GMP manufacturing. And, and within that time, we moved from biopharma into cell and gene therapies. Um, currently sitting at about 60 people, planning to be around about 200 in about three or four years' time. Great, cool. thanks, Angela. Kirsten? Me next. So my name is Kirsten Papenfuss and I know I said earlier I'm a director of Antiverse. Don't worry, I'm not on the wrong panel. My day job is actually to work as associate director for pharma at Deep Science Ventures. Uh, we are a venture creator. We start deep tech companies from scratch just based on a concept. We work across four verticals, uh, climate, uh, agri-food tech, computation and therapeutics. And I had the therapeutics arms of Deep Science Ventures. Um, our way of 
thinking about problems lends itself to this kind of scientific engineering approach. And then you end up with new companies that are either in the computational biology space or largely in the advanced therapy space. And yeah, yeah currently we have uh, 10 companies in the portfolio, currently building uh, at least four more this year, also in the advanced therapy space. Mm -hmm. And I feel really, really passionate about this kind of manufacturing issue because you can come up with the wildest concepts unless you can make them. They're never going to reach the patients. And as an investor with my investment hat on, Manufacturing is where most of these have failed to date, so that's where the attention needs to go. Thanks, Kirsten. Julie? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Julie Wood. I'm the Global Commercial Director for Cell and Gene Therapy at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I normally start that with the largest company no one's ever heard of, but this audience will have all have heard of Thermo Fisher in some shape or form. Um, so as you probably all know, so from research right the way through to clinical trials and everything in between, so we have Pathion, PPD, we've made a number of acquisitions over the years. So um, primarily uh, my team is involved in strategic collaboration. So how we can partner with biotech to ensure that we are building innovation out um, with patients being at the heart of, of everything that we do. Great, thanks, Julie. So to, to start the panel discussion, if we, we start um, with CAR-T, which has been a modality which has been very successful over the last few years, mm -hmm. attracted a lot of attention in the press, a lot of investment, um, and it has been very successful, particularly for blood cancers, obviously. Um, if we start there, could we give the audience, so just some idea, if you're a startup company, you're looking to develop um, a CAR-T therapy, so something like Kimria or Brianzi, um, yes, Carter, and you have a choice between going down the allogeneic route or the autologous route. What are the manufacturing differences? Just a couple of key differences. And also, um, just I think to give us a view of what the current market sentiment is around those two different paths. So, Kirsten, can we start with you on that, please? It's a bit of an unfair question because I think we've answered that question for DSV already because we started Imtune Therapies, which is an in vivo CAR T approach. Because uh, what, well, I don't know, can we do a show of hands or something? Is that okay to do? How many yeah. of you know the difference between autologous approach and an allogeneic approach? Oh, Easy too. peasy. So I think we can cut that short. Yeah. <laughs> so basically an autologous approach for those of you that don't know is you take out the patient's own cells and then engineer them outside of the body and then re-inject them. And because you need to get the patient cells back into the same patients, that's first of all a total logistical nightmare and also takes a really, really long time. And if we're talking about cancer, some patients actually don't have that time and basically die in the process. So obviously that's no good. And then you have the allogeneic pro uh, process where you're kind of working around the kind of immune constraints by um, taking a standardized cell line that you can actually do from um, certain immune characterized cell lines or from a hyperimmune cell line. And then you can basically inject those cells into any patients. And um, yeah, that's where the field seems to go mostly. Uh, we have gone down a really different route. Um, so we believe you can cut out the whole cell engineering process and actually move that into the body itself. So that's, I think, where I'm going to put my money or have put my money. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what, where are you on this? Um, well, actually, I've, I've been at GSK. I was mostly on, on uh, autologous uh, <coughs> CAR T cells and T cell therapies. And now I'm, I'm the other side with the allogenic cell therapy. So uh, let me give you a bit of my, my experience on this. Um, and I completely agree with the, the first statement we, we heard here. Um, I think we, the, the definition between, the choice between allergenic and autologous has to be made in part, well, based on three aspects. There's the manufacturing considerations, there are the safety considerations, and then there is the efficacy called dur durability. And I think that if the first successes with CAR T cells were uh, done with autologous cell therapies, with you know, CAR June, and uh, I think the first patient now has been more than eight years without uh, uh, cancer. Ten. That is big. Ten. Oh, ten. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Anyone for more? Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so, so then, then it's actually a, a, a reflection of the fact that you know a, a lot of uh, uh, risk had had to be taken into you know creating these cells, and they had to. They, this was academic work, and it was also building on all the work that had been done on stem cell transplantations uh, in in the field for you know, B cell. Uh, malignancies and therefore it was therefore it came to a, the autologous path. Now of course people then get a bit used to that and say okay it works uh, now I'm going to turn my eyes on the other problems and the other problems are oh it's actually very complex it's very costly can we do it in a more simple way 
And if you look at allogenic therapies that were tried well before the year 2000 and so forth, most of them failed. So you, could do, you couldn't do stem cell transplant because there was rejection uh, with using these, these non-related donor cells. Um, the thing is that it's all coming back now. And it's coming back now because, one, we have a much better understanding of the cell biology. Two, we have fantastic tools at hand. We have CRISPR technology, zinc fingers, talents, and so on, to engineer the cells so that we can actually address the main problems with allogenic cell therapies, which were you know, rejection, uh, sorry, grass versus uh, host disease, and of course, you know, the rejection over, over time, which could happen through the fact that you know, over time, these uh, uh, allogenic cells are recognized and, and removed. And therefore, if you want to treat cancer, you know, big tumor, um, you clearly need a lot of uh, active CAR T cells for doing that. And it's not possible to do with a therapy that would literally disappear from the circulation after a few weeks. So I think the, we are now at the, at the point where the technology on allogenic cell therapy is really rapidly advancing. It, and it enables really to create these cells that have a, a much better performance and durability. And we start to see the data. We know CRISPR therapeutics recently presented some fantastic data. I'm not slagging off completely autologous cell therapies. I think <laughs> that it will always have its, its place. Uh, outside of the CAR T cells, we obviously have the rare disease and we should spend maybe some time to discuss that. But even in the settings of cancer, if you think um, wonderful results obtained on, on tumor inf infiltrating the lymphocytes by oil vents, I think it's something that we should not forget because whatever the method you use, it still matters. One thing matters is can you cure the patient? Can you cure a very hard to treat solid tumor? And I think that the answer is still not there. Thanks, Can I Laura. add something? Yeah, go quickly? ahead. So I did a bit of a scan of our project portfolio because we have about 40 projects, say, ongoing at any one time. And it was quite interesting because we have four QPs on our team, so they're named on the license of, of uh, a number of facilities. They're actually releasing batches. They're nearly all working on autologous mm -hmm. batches because that's where that's what's in the clinic now or uh, you know, moving towards commercial or in commercial. But if you look at the consultancy and the lab, that's nearly all allogeneic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's just a nice little picture of kind of where the industry's going. Yeah. All different kinds of allogeneic, from mm -hmm. cells to vectors to RNA, whatever. But, but yeah, allogeneic. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So Angela, staying with you, can, can you give us an idea of, um, we've talked a little about the difference between allogeneic and autologous, but compare cell therapy and gene therapy as well with a previous generation of modalities like mm -hmm. monoclonal antibodies or something mm -hmm. like that. What are the, the key differences in the manufacturing challenges that you face with those? Yeah, so we've seen um, that the, there's a, the CMC process, the process that you go through to, to, to work out what do you need to do to manufacture, what are all the, what's the process development you have to do, what's the analytical development, um, what's the quality attributes around your product, all of those, that process is the same whether you're a biologic or a cell therapy, but the challenges of cell therapies are, are, are that much greater. Um, and we've seen, I think, famously an FDA, now ex-FDA inspector say that with cell and gene therapies, you know, 80% of the questions that come out from the FDA are about manufacturing, 20% about clinical. If you look at every other modality, it's 80% clinical, 20% manufacturing. So there are a lot of issues in manufacturing and specifically to do with cell and gene therapies, which some of it is to do with quality of starting materials, some of it is to do with novel gene editing techniques, some of it to do is to do with unintended gene modifications that can come about. There's, there's, it's new, there's a lot of challenges in there. So whilst it's the same process we're going through, the, the challenges are, are higher right now. And Steve, Julie, what are you seeing from the, the more commercial side of this? <coughs> I, you know, I, I think to your point is it's very, the manufacturing approach has many challenges and there's no set process yet. So we are still in that, pro you know, the reason why we are collaborating so closely is that the technology, we're still developing the technology as we're at the same time as we're trying to get to <coughs> clinic. And that, that presents its challenges. There's no one process to follow for cell therapy. There's no one process to manufacture. And the issues of, you know, even the simplest issues of where do we locate when we think about manufacturing? Do we locate in the hospitals? Do we create a central hub? You know, because these, particularly in, in autologous, when you need the patient and it needs to go back into the patient. So that's, that's the real challenge. And how do we speed it up? You know, at the moment, it's a slow process. And that's not ideal. Some of the patients are, you know, are sick. 
to Kirsten's point, we, we really, really do need to, to look at how we work together to make sure we're able to speed up those technologies. And is there any chance that if, if it is an autologous therapy, you mentioned, Julie, you have a choice between do you do decentralised manufacturing close to the patient or do you try and do everything in one place, uh, which may make sort of issues of quality control easier and more straightforward. What, what are you seeing? What, what route are companies taking there? It's still really mixed. It's still really mixed. Even when you look at what's the instrumentation that's used, there's you know there's the, the closed module of the closed system. If you think about that scale up of how many patients you can actually treat within a given square footage, is challenging, really challenging. But there's no defined process. I think uh, really important points, and I think it's, it's fair to recognise that commercialisation of gene therapy is still in, in its infancy. So trying to compare it to biopharma or a different modality. Um, it is difficult to do. We were probably where biopharm was 20 years ago mm. and, and thinking about some of those first patients treated, their cells would have been manufactured in a process probably by an academic researcher or similar or in a, a small GMP lab in a hospital setting in a very manual process, very hands-on. Um, and what we're talking about today is trying to leap ahead to that point where we can automate, where we can um, make the system so it's scalable um, and, and, and financially viable as well. Um, and that takes time, and I think along the way we have to learn several lessons, as has happened in Biofarm. So we can start to put these platforms in place, so we can figure out what models work and which ones don't. Um, and and obviously there's so much interest in this area, so much potential that everyone wants to move fast, and it's that balance between what we know works and, and what is possible versus where we want to be. And, and I think that's really what drives some of the conversation around autologous versus allogeneic as well. I mean, yeah, I wonder if it would be helpful perhaps to give uh, some numbers here on, on the cost of goods for those therapies. Um, so, because actually, you know, um, just to put the bar, uh, antibodies, um, remember that time we were discussing this at GSK, the, the field is going to a, a point where they would produce one gram of antibody for the aim was less than $50, maybe less than $25 per gram of antibody. Okay. Um, now let's go for cell therapy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's try to imagine how, how much does that cost. Uh, you know, you know, what would a, what would be your number be uh, for autologous cell therapy? Um, if you take the example of career or similar, yeah. hundreds of thousands, so three, mm. four hundred thousand, or more, or more. <laughs> um, a million. <laughs> yeah. And and how many patients can one gram of antibody treat versus one batch of, of gene therapy? So mm -hmm. for autologous or autologous therapies, mm -hmm. one batch in manufacture with all the associated analytics and, and release of that product goes to one patient. Um, and that's an important concept to get your head around when you're trying to think about how do you make this a financially viable option versus one batch of, of an antibody which could treat thousands or more patients. Um, and that's, that's where the thinking around allogeneic and an off-the-shelf sort of therapy really ties in and, and moving from a a very bespoke, personalised treatment in gene therapy to something which is more available and more applicable to more patients at once. And I, I think that as at the moment, um, because we're low volume, it's very early in the industry, everything's expensive, so consumables are expensive, media is horrendously expensive. When you're looking at a cost of goods model, the, the biggest proportion of the cost is in the media, the raw materials and the consumables. It's not in the manufacturing facility or the people. Um, as we get to a more platforming methodology, which I'm sure we will get to eventually in all these different areas in gene therapy and, and different kinds of cell therapy, then those costs will come down and then they'll look more like, you know, more reasonable um, ac across that raw materials consumables angle. Yeah. So, so when you're putting your business model together as an early stage company, um, are reimbursement prices accommodating those differences in cost of goods? Kirsten, we were talking about reimbursement prices before, and what, what are you seeing there? And from an investor point of view, when you see a business model, what are you looking for? Well, I look initially really have the people considered reimbursement costs for full stop. That's the first question to ask, really. And oftentimes that is not actually done. That will just be, OK, we'll figure this out later. For me, that's not good enough. That needs to be thought out from the get go. Uh, what disease am I trying to cure? What's the quality of life of these patients at this point? And how much need to I do I actually need to improve my 
the lives of these patients in order to be able to get my therapy reimbursed? And does my therapy even have the potential to do that? Um, because if you can't show a significantly improval of quality of adjusted life years or what they call it, um, then there is no reimbursement body in the world that will fork out the costs that it currently costs to get a cell or gene therapy onto the market. Uh, so that's one of the points of the consideration that you need to work out really early on. And then really think about what's the best, most scalable way, scalable way of manufacturing your product and then not actually being stuck with the technology that you originally thought of, but being flexible mm -hmm. to maybe think of a different delivery strategy or a, a cheaper, more scalable thing that other people have used that has already been proven to be safe. Uh, think about the components that you actually have in your solution and whether you can uh, switch to other ones that might actually be cheaper or more efficient or have precedent, really. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've seen a number of therapies come to the market, be authorised, and then mm -hmm. fail commercially mm -hmm. and be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Commercially non viable. Yeah. And is that because these issues, I mean, to be fair, obviously, as, as Angela says, it's a very fast moving field. Um, and, and the models, that there isn't a well established model either on the technical side, the manufacturing side, or the commercial side. Um, and, and so companies have sort of tried it and then sort of put their toe in the water and then found it hasn't actually worked and they've withdrawn the products from the yeah. market. And, and I think that's driving what we're seeing a lot in the investment side is investors are now expecting to see a really quite detailed mm -hmm. CMC strategy very early in the uh, company's development mm -hmm. on the basis that you need to know roughly, you know, what are the activities, how long is it going to take, how much is it going to cost? for you to get yes to your phase one, but also what's your plan? You don't have to get to commercial, but somebody needs to get to commercial. What is actually an outline plan to get to commercial? And they're expecting to see that you know, before your Series A funding. So it's, it's early on in the cycle uh, because manufacturing is such a key issue in CGT. I think the, the, the commercial so stories that we heard, I, mean, I think half of them are failures or difficulties because of manufacturing. They try to be consistent with the product and so on. And Bluebird Bio has a, a few of those. And then there's our commercial fa fa failures, really because of the, there is no, no proper system in place for the reimbursement. I think a, a good example for that is, is with Orchard Therapeutic. I mean, they, they, they took forward, put forward the Strimbellis, which was essentially the first lit, you know, approved ex vivo stem mm -hmm. cell therapy engineered for, with, uh, for the treatment of ADS kit. No doubt, this is really changing the life of those kids. Um, they, 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 they behave completely well, they're out of their bubble. Uh, and yet, here is, a, here it is a company led by you know, scientific innovators and still demonstrating that you, you can't bring it forward. I think the two, the two reasons I can see uh, that explaining this is, one is, um, if you work in extremely uh, rare diseases, um, the model, a commercial model is probably unlikely to succeed. And, and I heard, again, uh, Francis Collins talking about that in, in the latest AHGCT conference. They tried to do for very rare diseases like Porgia and so on and really failed to, to have a model that were, would be essentially a con conclusive with, with actually a, a, a private company business plan. So I think we need a more partnership system where the government would be more uh, intervening in, uh, with insurances and payers to, to have this model working. Um, that's, I think, is the problem. But if you were to go for less rare diseases, uh, yet you have, but not so, so much. You go to beta thalassemia, uh, sickle cell diseases, uh, uh, hemophilia. I think there, there is a real uh, option to uh, make the case that there will be volume, yet it is expensive, but the volume is large enough to justify using these, these therapies. Now, on manufacturing cost, just coming back to that slightly, we had you explaining that obviously you save a lot on logistics in terms of with autologous therapies, the need to remove the cells from the patient and ship them to the manufacturing centre, ship them back again. But with allogeneic therapies, you need to find a good source of your, of your originating material, mm. of, of your cell. Yeah. Um, and when I was at the Catapult, there was some discussion about whether we should be developing cell lines, GMP cell lines for, for use in the UK, uh, as well as other places, which could be made available at a lower cost than those which are available commercially. Um, is that a significant so royalties that you pay on, on stem cell inputs into the process? Is that a significant cost on the allogeneic side? Um, yeah, un unfortunately, yes. Um, 
Because I think the, the sources of those uh, satellites is very rare, essentially. Yeah. Only a, a few companies are um, proposing these satellites for commercial purposes. Remember, they have to be you know, made of GMP grade, but also they have to be co donor consented. Which, you know, only a few, a few cell lines uh, are in, in that setting. Um, on top of that, you, of course, you need to add the, the royalties linked to the programming technology, so linked to the uh, Academy of Japan. Um, it's high watering numbers, uh, frankly, when you think this is just a sales material for which you're going to make your engineer sales and manufacturers and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a real need to, uh, perhaps in the UK, uh, uh, foster the uh, initiative whereby uh, a wide range of uh, cell lines would be available. And this is not like your bo bona fide uh, chose cell line by which you can make all possible antibodies. Uh, IPC cell lines are very, very different. They behave very differently whether how you program them further into uh, your final cell lines uh, and how they react also to the genomic uh, uh, intervention. So we need large libraries of IPC cell lines that are donor consented and GMP approved. Yeah, so that's a really important point, having your right IPSC GMP starting point, which really leads to a lot of royalty stacking, which from an investment point is key to consider from the get-go. But the problem is if you're a new IPSC-based company, that's not the sexy part that you're going to go and raise your money with, but it's a really crucial thing to have. So there's always the kind of problem what part of my technology do I develop first? Because you actually need to develop first what gives you that differentiation in order to raise money, but then you don't have it on the platform that you actually need in order to turn this into a therapeutic product, which means that at a later stage, you need to go back and actually find that line and then re-engineer everything in that line. However, as uh, was just said by Francois, they're all very different, so then you might not find the same results that you find in your original cell line that you've worked with. So that adds another technology risk on top of the royalty stacking. Yeah. Plus a slowdown in the development oh, yeah. cycle, which is, which is the, yeah. the key thing here is we're trying to get there quickly. So yeah, I'm, I'm fully on board <laughs> with having some centralized thing that everybody can use. That, that would be perfect. Interesting. And Angela, you mentioned earlier that, that you're seeing investors wanting to see a credible CMC strategy in place yeah. pre-Series A, and that seems to be much earlier than you would expect management to be turning their minds to those type of CMC issues that it, yeah. in some other modalities. I, I think, uh, yeah, and I was recently, um, I think we do have some life art people here, I was recently at the coordinators meeting for the life art G, uh, MRC GMP hubs. And, and the even in grant funding applications, you need to have mm. some element of a CMC strategy. So, you, you know, it is now expected that you're thinking about it, even at high level and phase appropriate. You know, you, you don't need a, a, a preclinical to be doing stuff that you would need to do at phase three. So it's got to be phase appropriate, but you need to be doing stuff early, thinking it through early um, and focusing on your process development early so that you end up with a commercializable, scalable process right from the beginning, which means that you don't go around in the circle of, I got to phase two and now I have to go back and redo my process and now I've got comparability and do I have to do another clinical trial? You know, that's where we don't want to be. But, but think, we have gone around that loop several times. <laughs> I think that shows some of the learnings of, of what we've been through so far. So in gene therapy, a lot of the early trials were academic led um, through very keen researchers just desperate to get the science into patients and, and see it work. Um, and, and frankly, there was that focus on that phase one, getting into patients, show it safe and show it as efficacy. Um, and from my perspective, I've been there, I'm thinking beyond that to commercialization, you know, 20 years ago was, was miles from your thoughts because it was, it was, we were still trying to show it works. Um, I think in the intervening period where perhaps bigger companies have got involved who had spin outs where we're trying to take it beyond phase one, suddenly you realize that the processes put in place for that early phase were just not appropriate. And the amount of work you need to do to go back to, to improve security assurance or scale, understanding those changes in the process, what's involved, uh, the testing of that, the cost and the time is, is immense. And I think it's a, a really important point to have that plan from the start, but also to skill, uh, increase the skill in the people at the early phase to understand what that means. Um, because at, at the beginning, those skills just didn't yeah. exist. So it's, there's an element of training. I think the fact we're asking or being asked those questions is good because it drives that, that mindset of how do we go all the way through? Even if we don't have to fix all the problems to begin with, what changes might we have to make and how can we avoid having to, 
to reinvent the wheel halfway through. And, yeah. and the, the argument against that, which I often get, is, oh, I haven't got the, you know, I haven't got the money to pay for that uh, now. And, and my argument back is, it doesn't cost any more money to do it right first time. You just have to think it through. Yep. Yeah, and the, the, the issue particularly with set therapy is, is no, I, I was in the antibody world not some time ago, mm -hmm. um, and you could more or less say, well, actually, my molecule is slightly different to another, but the process should be pretty, pretty similar. And there is an industry outside to help us with this. And uh, now try to, you know, your process to, to, to multiply T-Rex is completely different to make uh, red blood cells or to make a, a normal gamma delta T cells. And that's actually very, feels very cottage industry, therefore. And mm -hmm. present, I understand why investors would say, OK, you come with this new crazy cell you want to make. But there is no reference as to how you should, you know, um, how, how much would it cost? Or you, how long would it take? Uh, what sort of uh, system you need to put in place, in automation system and, and closed system? So it's very difficult. Uh, I understand the question. Uh, but it, I think as long as the investors are, as you say, educated to understand mm -hmm. that, there would be a lot of um, uh, fluctuations in the evaluations of how long it takes, mm -hmm. you know, how much money it would take, yeah. then it's fine. So what, what strategies are you seeing that are working for, for early stage companies then? Are they, are they recruiting expertise in manufacturing at a much earlier stage than you would expect? Are they partnering with service providers? Um, are they planning to develop all this in-house right the way up to commercial scale manufacturing? What, what are you seeing that works both from a a company point of view, an investor point of view, and from a regulator point of view? From an expertise perspective, I think it's variable. So, so some companies take the decision to bring in a CMC, a head of CMC very early, and some companies don't, and, they, and they'll, I mean, we, we do interim CMC work sometimes, or consulting CMC work sometimes. So I think both. From a manufacturing perspective, almost exclusively, I think we see early phase companies outsourcing their, their early phase manufacture because they you know, nobody wants them to spend their limited funds on building a facility. Um, it's not good use of money. They, and they don't actually know what they need to be building in the first stage. They don't know really where the process is going. They don't know what the market's going to look like. They don't know if their clinical trials is going to be successful. So there's a whole heap of risk. Um, but as soon as they get line of sight to market and they can see some good clinical results, then we nearly always get our clients saying, well, now we'd like to build our own facility. Um, and, and then it's a case of trying to build their facility so that you minimise the risk of that tech transfer from the outsourced manufacturer into their in-house supply, which is not insignificant, but you, know, you have to do it some, at some point, and, and if, you know, the least risky method is, is the preferred. Yeah, sure. And, and I think one, one way to mitigate issues for, for small companies is engagement with regulators pretty mm -hmm. early. Yes. So, uh, Actually, uh, you know, we we haven't we haven't even got Mars data, and we're going to talk with regulators next week. So just to give you an idea, uh, or soon we try yeah. to have this conversation yeah. because it's uh, you know we're planning already the future. We're thinking about you know raw materials, how we do the interventions on the cells and so forth, and having those directions and it by well, first educating regulators yeah. and then having their answers will constantly help us with yeah. defining the strategy. And they're very helpful. They are. Yep. Yeah. And Julia, Thermo Fisher, how are you looking to work with early stage companies? Again, it's, that, it's a close collaboration. Obviously, if we can innovate together, that helps a commercial company as well, as, as well as giving that, um, the smaller biotechs that competitive advantage. You know, there's a lot of products we have that are in development that aren't out there that you can't access. So it's that early access to technology. Um, and it's sharing the experience. We have a lot of experienced people within our organization, both within R&D and also within that process development and in the scale up with the CRO to CDMO to clinical trials to the regulatory support. So I think it's that reduce the perception of we are just purely commercial, but it's more on that partnership side of how we can leverage our experience across the fields. You know, we're not just selling gene therapy. We have experience in manufacturing within other areas as well for how we can support. And one of the, I mean, one of the questions we were asked to consider as a panel were, was the difference between like an end-to-end -end approach in the manufacturing compared, I guess, to more, um, I don't know, ad hoc outsourcing, I suppose you might put it. Um, can you, do you have any thoughts to share on that, the, the advantages and disadvantages of each? I think to Angela's point earlier, if you, the less rework you have to do, 
So if you can start with a reliable source of your consumables, of your instrumentation, of your support, that can help you the whole way through the process. That's less coming back to the beginning, so that reduces costs as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, an option people need to consider is that early, the really early phase before you're even considering that clinical, when you're just in research, it's important to have someone that can take you through to the, towards the end. It's a real push-pull, isn't it, between you know, the, the clinical academics who want to get into their patient as quickly, you know, treat the patients as quickly as possible with treating the end patients as quickly as possible, which, isn't, which is not necessarily the same thing. Hmm. But what's useful is there's, there's now obviously an awareness of how difficult CMC and manufacturers, mm. um, we're talking about the balance of, of difficulty earlier, um, and, and the people are trying to put options in place. So there's, there's so many different ways to approach gene therapy. That's one of the things I love about it. It's all the different tools which are available, and none of them are perfect. And you always have to pick the right approach for what your medicine is. We're talking only about target product profile, um, and I think some are more complex than others. So in some situations, an end-to-end -end, um, approach might look relatively simple. You might have few raw materials coming in and perhaps a product, maybe thinking about direct in vivo gene therapy where you're making a virus and, and that's it. For cell therapies where you maybe need different components coming in, a, a viral vector for treatment or a gene editing step, um, it starts to get more complex. And I think what's available now is through that recognition of how difficult this is, people trying to put things in place to help manufacture. So um, for instance, gene therapy hubs to, to make virus you know, funded by LifeArc and the MRC, BBSRC to help take some of that pressure off of people having to put this in place themselves, or, or um, aspects like the cell and gene therapy catapult who have expertise, have space that you can hire and, and put your process into that, but you don't have to actually build the facility yourself. And so I think all of these tools are useful yeah. for people to go out shopping and, and figure out what works best for them. Yeah, I think it is different for different companies, depends what their strategy is, whether they're whether, you know, whether they want to have manufacturing resource in-house, in which case you know, that kind of hotel approach for manufacturer is great because mm. you're developing your manufacturing team, that's fine. Some companies don't want to be distracted by developing a manufacturing team, so then you're definitely going to outsource. And some companies still do really say, right from the beginning, I want to build my own facility, I want it all in-house, and, and that, that has worked for some companies. So I, I think it goes with your business strategy. It's not just a manufacturing strategy, it's the whole the whole business strategy. Yeah, sure. Well, we've, we've got a few minutes now, I think, for some questions. Um, so I'll open up the discussion to the floor and see if you've got any questions. And then we'll come back to the panel for um, just some closing thoughts about the topic. So do we have any questions for the panel, please? Gentlemen at the back. Uh, hi, James Halliman, Cambridge Consultants. Um, we're doing quite a bit of work with the Catapult um, around being able to monitor manufacture and things like this. And my question for the panel is, as we are moving more to allogeneics and we're moving to larger and larger batch sizes where we start to think about making enough in a batch to treat a thousand, make a thousand doses or 10,000 doses and beyond, do we really have the understanding and the skill set to be able to predict how the manufacturing of those sorts of volumes of cells, tens or hundreds or thousands of litres is really going to work? Um, or are we just taking wild stabs in the dark? Steve. <laughs> so, um, I, I think, again, we're learning. So I'd like to say it's not a wild stab in the dark. And I think with, with allergenic, obviously, again, it's developing technology. And it will start not necessarily with tens of thousands of patients. But can we, can we build on what we know with autologous to apply this to a particular disease setting? And maybe that will be a few hundred patients in the, in the first round. But it's having that view of where you're going with it and, and how do we want to go from a few hundred patients to a few thousand patients and what has to happen to the scale, to the process in between. And you, you mentioned analytics. I mean, that's absolutely key here. The understanding of the product that you're trying to make, that, that design space that you have, so that as you do scale, you have a, a really robust understanding of, of what works, what doesn't, um, what changes you can make and what you can't. And I think that gives us a chance to build that expertise as we go along and as we grow as a, as a community. Um, but there's lots of unknowns, you're absolutely right. I think it depends a bit what, what um, product type you're talking about. So if, if we're talking about AAV, for example, a viral vector, there's reasonable confidence now that you know, what, what was 50 litres is now 200, is now 1,000, 2,000 is very achievable. 
Um, but if you said 10,000, then I, I'm not sure that, that, that where we are now can, can, can accurately predict that. But if you're talking about IPSCs, we're nowhere near that. So you know, it depends a little bit you know, which product type you're talking about. Sure. I, think, I, think the, I think there are two, two considerations here. One is, uh, like before injecting your product, uh, it's clear that, um, to me at least, uh, that with uh, IPSC technology, um, we're more likely to end up with a consistent product. You know, of where, when we define characteristic and so on. If you put that against uh, CAR T cells for autologous cell therapies, you receive batches from cells from the patients who are, you know, being multiply treated with, with cancer therapies. Uh, their cell might not be in a good state. There's lots of work innovation to try to revive them to make sure they are all like you know, uh, stem cell phenotype and they're all performing well. But it's true that I think the um, fair to say that the allogenic approach using iPCs is more likely to generate consistent product. I think what's missing, though, is uh, data from essentially the real world back into the, the manufacturing. So um, I don't think there's enough yet done to understand you know, what sort of phenotype of a cell uh, or, or epigenome of a signature of a cell result in effect X into a patient. Uh, we use very coarse measures. We say, oh yeah, the patient received 10 billion of cells and they were all CD4s or CD8s. That's fine. That's probably as far as, as, far as we go. So I think to, to, I think to, to support the, the, the idea of that like we're going to treat more and more patients, we need also to have more and more data coming back from the patient, how the cell performing to them so that we can fine tune those, those processes and know exactly what we need to make. Otherwise, we're going to build capabilities too fast and we're not going to find the patient for that because we don't know exactly how best to treat them. Julie, do you have any views on allogeneic scale up? I think you know we're seeing pockets of success, but again, it, it's you know IPS cells are challenging. We know they are incredibly challenging to scale up. So, mm. you know, it, it will it change significantly in the future? I hope so. <laughs> but you know, and it has to in order to make it more cost effective. You know, I think we've, we've already proved that autologous is you know things can things change enough in autologous therapy? Then allogeneic has to be the way that we go. You know, particularly when we're following on from a panel when they're talking about you know the cost of microbials and treatments to cell and gene therapy where it costs for five hundred thousand pounds per patient you know how do we then actually take that to other countries that aren't incredibly wealthy mm -hmm. yeah. any other questions yelena oh sorry just to follow on to the editor of Nednaus. Just to follow on on the IPSC question, if you had to list the pros and cons of healthy donor versus IPSC cells as the way forward for allogeneic, what would be the pros and cons of each? <laughs> You're already <Okay>. sold. Back <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the spot here. Um, all right. Okay. Um, and by healthy donors, you mean healthy stem cell from donors. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, anyway, and of course, there are whole companies building their, their platform using uh, uh, cells from donors. Um, you know, I think Rubius, for example, they make red blood cells using uh, uh, CD4 uh, type 0 cells and, and use that for patients. So as long as you have a supply of, of uh, donors, uh, you can probably do this. Um, I do like that in a way that you create very mature cells. Um, I think the, the challenge with IPSCs is, is as we all well know, is can we create, we create cells that have the, the, the proper uh, phenotype? Um, the, I think the, for, at least also for a company like us, um, and maybe this is where also the whole field will go, um, as long as you perhaps use unmodified cells, I can live with the idea of using you know, a panoply of donors um, and making the, giving match cells um, to, to patients. But the science is moving us towards you know, more and more clever engineering, you know, more and more uh, crisp editing, more and more you know, reprogramming of cells and so on. And that is not something that is quite straightforward to do using stem cells. They, have, they are not so immortal than, than normal donor cells, even they are stem cells. So, I think we will have to go through the IPSC route if we want to create these new, very highly clever programmable cells. Good answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
Hi, um, Elena Lexic from Harm Enable. Um, so, linking back to this kind of scale up question, um, so uh, I mean, a big barrier to the adoption of these types of therapies in healthcare is, is the cost of them, of course. So, I was wondering if you could comment on what proportion of the cost is linked to the kind of tricky manufacturing versus things like regulatory requirements and kind of post marketing monitoring and things like that. Um, and in your opinion, what would be some interesting areas of innovation that might be able to bring these costs down in the future and enable kind of better scale-ups? On, 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 yeah, on, yeah. on the manufacturing, <laughs> the manufacturing side, yeah. um, uh, we're interested in everybody else's view. My view is that a large part of the cost of the product is, is in the manufacturing currently. Um, that's clearly not where we want to end up. Um, but yeah, but that's where we are now in terms of innovation. Um, I think uh, anything which makes the process more robust, more repeatable, more scalable, um, and, and a lot of people are focusing in this area, and there's lots of innovation actually, lots of new products. Um, it's almost too many new products because I, th I think where we're struggling is to work out, you know, which of these, if we even if we go back to autologous, which of these kind of factory in a box approaches are actually going to be the right ones and you know when you've got 10 which one do you choose <laughs> um, and you know you go back to thermo versus a cytiva versus the sartorius versus a pal everybody's got something um, you know as a as a therapy developer how do you you know how do you choose because uh, some of them are going to make it and some of them are not going to make it and you don't you know you don't want to be somewhere where you've only got a single source of supply for something that's critical in your manufacture so um, I'm not sure that's been incredibly helpful, but I think that's where we are. <laughs> I can put in on an innovation okay. question. So we're actually in the process right now of creating a new company together with the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, actually that's focused on removing some of the challenges in the iPSC scale-up. And um, we've discussed some of the issues that we see. So um, they need to be phenotypically stable. And at the moment, it's just we're trying to generate one specific phenotype, and then we kind of hope it stays that way. Can you maybe engineer a phenotype lock, right? Genetically, maybe. Or at the moment, we're having a differentiation process, and 80% ends up in the cell type that I want, and 20% are still kind of stem cell-y. Those are the ones that you don't want to inject in the, in the patient. So at a small scale, you can filter them out, right? You can do fax separation or you can do beats, right? But if I want to look at cardiomyocytes, for example, where I probably will need 10 to the power of 13 cells, then that's not feasible. Can I actually get the cells to tell me whether they're right felt the phenotype, for example? So those are the types of innovations that we are going to look at. Thank you, Susan. I think there's a chip in on that as well. Efficiency comes with scale, um, and, and when you if you have a manufacturing site, throughput is important. So the more patients you can treat, or the more batches you can make, there's, there's scalability of cost, um, mm -hmm. and that will very much depend on what you're trying to do. So with the allergenic approach, or if you're making viral vectors, we can learn from Biofarm and just try and scale up. If it's autologous, making more of a batch won't help because you'll just be able to treat one patient still. So when it's scaling out, then how can you treat more patients at once? And that really starts to affect your facility design and, and how you go about doing that. So again, that clear plan of what you're trying to achieve, where the endpoint is, and, and really what your patient population and your product looks like is, is really critical from day one. And, and maybe another one on, on innovation. Um, if you go back to the, the I admit you know, a lot of the cost is indeed into the analytics and so on, but uh, a lot of the cost as well is in, is in, the, in the fact that you, you block a, a pilot plan uh, for your manufacturer. And uh, it's eye watering how much does that cost in, in the final price just to keep the aircon going and some people you know, manning the site. And so if you can reduce the number of days that your cell therapy needs to be manufactured, mm -hmm. you, you're making actually a, a massive saving. Uh, yeah. So you can go out of your way and say, actually, I'm not going to do any cell therapies. I'm going to just inject straight the vector. <laughs> it's going to find my CD8s, turn them into CAR T cells, and job done. Um, and I hope it works. Um, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the other push, you, you could start to say, well, actually, it's a bit, uh, we have a sort of, a, we have a dogmatic view, we say, the manufacturing goes to make the product to the end, and then the product acts immediately in the patient. It's sort of a same view as we have with a, you know, a chemical entity or a map. But what if you were to use the human body to do the last part of the manufacturing? And so, so um, you know, we've seen so I mean, the CAR T cell fields 
in a relatively easy kind of cancer settings, I admit, but where people are actually cut down the manufacturing uh, from 20 days to 14 days to 10 days to five days, even smaller than that. Mm. I think there's much more biology we could do here yeah. to try to understand how we could maybe inject the minimum amount mm -hmm. of cells engineer them some ways mm -hmm. that they'll find their ways mm -hmm. they multiply and they do the job so mm -hmm. a lot more to do there and actually with the advantage perhaps that you go so you could do less uh, uh, less toxic uh, lymphodepletion mm -hmm. treatment on patients yeah right we are we're up against time so i think we'll wrap up there um, i won't put you on the spot by asking for a one sentence recommendation <laughs> to management <laughs> of an early stage company for their manufacturing strategy but people can reach you um, in the coffee break afterwards if they if they want that word of wisdom uh, I'll just thank you for the panel for, for your input and for sharing your thoughts with us. It's been a great session. Thank you. Thank you.